There's been a common theme in the writing of AOS lore that really hasn't sat right with me since the game launched, and that is the use of simplified or broad terms to describe massive turning points in the lore's history. Like, everything was fine until the Age of Chaos came. Because it makes these, you know, the coming of these primordial and insidious powers seem so vague. But to be honest, the writers at Black Library have done an incredible job at fleshing out these instances piece by piece. A great example, and a relevant one, is the Cities of Sigmar book, right? For the longest time, it was just the good guys retreated to Azir. But the Battle Tome really changed that narrative. Now it's full of loss and pain and drama and shows a ragged bunch of like refugee races all struggling to work together for survival. This week, we are diving into the Slaves to Darkness Battle Tome a book that I have been excited about for years. A book that paints a picture of the realms in utter anarchy, right? What happens when ancient tribal religions reach a hysterical zealotry? What happens when people's whole world, right, falls apart around them? And what happens when your god abandons you? I spent a lot of time in these Cities of Sigmar book really stressing the pain and the hardships of the survivors who poured into Azir, right? Highlighting how much they had lost, what they paid for survival, and they gave up to get a, just a monicum of protection from Sigmar. And this week, we're going to talk about the others. Those who were left destitute, alone, helpless, and desperate because this book forms the second narrative of what happened when the doors to Azir closed. Those who see Sigmar as the righteous protector, right, who made the hardest choices possible to preserve the, the spark of light in an utter sea of darkness. But the second narrative is those who felt abandoned by their gods. Lifetimes of prayer and devotion left void in their hour of need, scorned by the god king that their societies had spent centuries worshipping, filled with hate and a desire for vengeance, but too distracted by immediate survival to act upon those impulses. Now, I know not everyone appreciates uh, moral relativism, right? But the perspective of these two entities here are both true. Sigmar couldn't save them all, so he made the hard choice and saved those who could. But in doing so, he abandoned millions to a horrific fate. An age of terror and war that had never been seen before. And they rightly hate him for it. This hard choice that Sigmar had made forces the tribes and nations of people to make hard decisions of their own, right? All, everyone outside of the gate of Azir had a hard decision too, right? Do we die filled with anger at our gods and telling ourselves how good and noble, at least we're not chaos, you know, that kind of thing? Or do we choose to survive, pledging ourselves to a lifetime of service to the chaos gods? This book is the story of those who chose the latter, and in seeking the tiniest light of hope, they became slaves to darkness. Now, I will say up front, this is a very difficult book to cover for a lore series, and that's because it leaves so much room open for you to craft your own story that kind of pinning down the nuts and bolts here and there is, is actually quite difficult to kind of put it in a very like uh, easy to convey series of videos. That being said, my fundamental question driving me as I read all this was, like, what is this faction actually like, right? How did they spread like wildfire in the Age of Chaos? What are their lives like? They all have to have kids and families. I mean, these warriors come from somewhere. And this book does give us some pictures of that. And to do my best, again, like I said, it's, it's super broad. If you have a narrative that you've crafted, it does fit into this book. But for the purposes of me trying to explain it to other people, I really just broke it down into two broad origins, right? Uh, when you talk about a Slaves to Darkness warband, typically you have good forces that turned bad. Good can be in quotes there. Maybe they're, maybe they're just morally neutral, it doesn't matter. But, you know, people who are not chaos, who turned chaos. And also tribal societies that amplified when the chaos gods came. Right, so let's break that down a little bit. I want to emphasize the fact that this is not meant to be a box limiting your narrative. It's not A or B, but broad categorizations that help me kind of relay information to you. Starting off with the tribal clans that got worse, and this is actually a super fascinating one if it's something that interests you at all. Um, there's actually an origin story that we have with an incredible amount of lore in Gav Thorpe's Black Library novel, The Red Feast. 
It chronicles a primitive tribe living in Akshi with this proud warrior heritage. They're good folks, they have an honor code and traditions. It gives us a little insight into family structure and their former history as nomads, how they interact with other clans and stuff like that. And in addition, there are other tribes that are explored in that book in the same way. What all these little tribes in Akshi have in common is their worship of the old gods, not the pantheon of good ones like Sigmar, Alariel, and so forth nor the traditional chaos gods, the four. They have their own names, rites, and religious traditions for their worship, but what they don't know is that they're actually praying to corn. The chaos gods have many names that we'll explore in another video and present themselves to mortals in a myriad of different ways. You think you're uh, uh, worshiping a god of like honor through battle and martial pride, and it's a good and noble thing, but it's just one tiny facet of corn's nature. And that book really explores the escalation of the chaos entry into the realms in the Age of Myth. That these prideful warrior folks saw their beliefs in their god blow way out of proportion. And it's clear to us as readers that this is corn, but they don't know that. Right, and their faith and this very respectable devotion became zealotry, which became fanaticism. And when your means of worship is the battlefield, things get hairy. Now I did a review of the Red Feast here on the channel. It's a good book. And I only mention it as an example, because as chaos was slowly corrupting the minds of mortals in the a age of chaos, sorry, age of myth, it began to make these tiny splashes into the realms, right? Wise mystics fell into like toxic obsessions with magic, Pla palaces of respite and luxury became corrupting pleasure cults, proud warriors became bloodthirsty murderers, and farmers whose lands who had fallen to rot and ruin embraced this environment and started to thrive in it. We'll do a full deep dive into the paths of damnation, why people choose these chaos gods in another video. But what I want to stress here is that at the age of chaos's start, innumerable tribes of humans, dwarden, and elves were primed and ready, right? Their, their age-old traditions unwittingly opening them up to corruption. So when things went to hell and chaos entered in force in the realms, there were already mortal armies answering the call because they had been slowly twisted to the breaking point. And that's kind of the, the broad categorization, I would say, like, you know, uh, tribals whose religion just got taken to the next level. They, they were not knowing who they were praying to, and it turned out to be a chaos god who took advantage of the situation. And now I want to move on to the, the quote-unquote good empires, right? Not necessarily morally pure, but just non-chaos that became chaos factions that capitulated to the forces. And to my knowledge, there isn't a specific novel that dives into this, not nearly in the same way as uh, the Red Feast did for the other. However, there is a corn hero from the Call of Archeon series. It's a short story collection uh, where... Uh, just to kind of give you a super brief rundown, he was the king of his people. A corn warband came in and uh, were repeatedly pushed back, so they were doing good on the defense because this main character we meet in the book is a great leader, great warrior, but the constant repelling of chaos drained them all of their resources and men and manpower and fighting strength. And so on the brink of death, the corn leader who was invading them offered him a bargain you can join our war band because you've proven that you have leadership and strength and resiliency. And this is a sign of respect from one warrior to another. The corn character we meet in this book agrees and he kind of uses this as an opportunity. Okay, I'm gonna join Korn's army, rise to the ranks, I'm gonna kill the man who sacked my city and destroy the forces of corn from the inside. So this would be an example of, you know, what would normally be considered a good guy kingdom, right? A holdout in the age of chaos being ground down and choosing to join chaos purely for survival. Now, in his case, he chose survival for a chance to get revenge, uh, even though it, it completely, utterly corrupted him, you know, since. But many others choose this fate for a myriad of reasons. Could be that they were angry that Sigmar didn't wait for them to close the gates. They feel abandoned by Alariel. Maybe Nurgle corrupted a river running through a town, and in despair from all this disease outbreak, they offered themselves up for, you know, mercy. For Slaanesh, they just rotted from the inside out with excesses and things like that. There's a lot of reasons why established cities, some the size of nations, would fall to chaos. And when you put these two kind of broad reasons together, and you give them hundreds of years to grow, expand, and compete, you get a very overwhelming army. Because 
I think the true importance of this book is the perspective on the forces of order that it offers, which is a strange twist coming from a chaos battle tone. But here's the thing, we've been reading all these books that show us order is doing great, right? We got more factions, we have well-defended cities, the gods are coming back to the Pantheon. But this book kind of like zooms out from that and shows us how, how big this progress is relative to what's left to be done. And in, they have achieved very little. The bastions of order are a pinprick of light in an endless sea of darkness. In fact, only the smallest fraction of mortals are not aligned to chaos. The slaves to darkness and the forces that they represent make up the overwhelming majority of life in the realms. Teeming masses, roving madmen and women, champions all on a quest for personal glory. It paints the bleakest picture possible, and that's a good thing, right? It's not 50-50 good versus evil, yin and yang. It's more like 90-10. The good guys, of course, being the 10. And that makes the cities of Sigmar so impressive, right? There are these bulwarks in the sea of chaos. But what it also does is gives us a picture of just how dark things are, and if you like this army, and if you like the Slaves to Darkness, they are still in ascendancy, and they are a terrifying force to behold. Now, why is this concept so cool, right? The idea of cities and tribes falling to chaos and, and the whole world just like revolving around Sigmar locked us out and now we have to fend for ourselves, right? I always end videos like this talking about what I think is cool. And this book has like the wheels in my head turning quite a bit. One of the things I love about it is that you can make any origin story you want, right? I personally split it into two broad categories, but there's endless possibilities within them, even more outside of that. The fact that champions get their lives extended from chaos gods, for example, Corgus Cole, is uh, for hundreds of years, right? He's a hundred, he's several hundred years old. The fact that he is still there and he was one of the first people to allow corn into the realm of fire means that you can set up a background in any time or place for your faction. You can create a way of life before chaos and then demonstrate that evolution in your lore. The freedom for storytelling in this book is unparalleled in my opinion. And it reminds me of the world outside of Azir, right? We focused a lot on the events of Azir during the Cities of Sigmar book, and this is the ultimate companion to it, right? This is for everyone else, or the other seven realms, the horrific choices of being consumed by evil or becoming the evil yourself, that tore the fabric of the world apart. Heroes were lost to unwinnable combat, good men became murderers, faithful servants became corrupted sycophants, and the world was plunged into madness. And this army, this book that we're going to be diving into this week, is the exact expression of that madness, a direct product of the world it is. It can come in many forms, and it can be anything from many nations and ethnicities, levels of society, but no one is immune from the temptation to become or the destruction by the slaves to darkness. And for that reason, I am so excited to jump into this lore week. This one, you know, it's kind of a strange book because there's so, uh, it's such a broad base to build whatever story you want. There's not a lot of like hard hitting facts in this book that kind of like force you down a certain path kind of thing. So it does get a little tricky to cover because it's a little more, you know, abstract. You know, I don't, I don't certainly don't want to like create a situation where someone feels like, oh, well, I can't do X because, you know, Doug said in his lore video, no, nope, nothing like that. This, this is really the truly a sandbox battle dome for you to create an incredibly compelling narrative for your heroes. And it does it at all levels. So like, for example, the, the thing I mentioned with Corgus Cole's age, you could have your warband start at any point in time in history and it would still make sense that they're still alive. You could have them be from any place, have them going any place. You could have them be a current thing, like one of the outposts from the cities of Sigmar just recently in the timeline of AOS fell to chaos because that's still a constant threat. The, the versatility for storytelling here, I think is, is, is really quite unique amongst battle tomes. And I hope that you have a great time going through this book with me this week. Like I said, there's not a lot of lore uh, in terms of compared to something like, say, the Stormcast book, where it's like very detailed and how he has things set up for his storm host. But we're going to be exploring you know, the chaos gods, why people fall to them specifically, the heroes and the units and what's going on at the All Gate with all the Warcry warbands and that kind of thing. So let me know what you're excited to learn about. Tell me uh, if you have a background for your Chaos Warband. Tell me all about it, I'd love to hear about it. Thank you all so much for watching and happy wargaming.